Okay, so we're going to be kind of finishing chapter three. This is the final part, part D, on the cells. So uh, a cell, uh, it goes, it has what's known as a cell cycle. And the cell cycle is the series of changes that a cell undergoes from the time it's formed until it reproduces. And there's two major periods of the cell cycle. There's interphase, and during interphase, this is when the cell is actually growing. It's getting big. Uh, it's uh, developing. It's carrying out its day-to-day -day activities. And it's also uh, replicating its DNA. And the other part is the mitotic phase, or cell division. And this is a period, it's a very short period of the cell's life that it's dividing into two identical cells. So the very first phase, interphase, uh, as I said earlier, it's a period from the cell forms uh, after cell division until the next uh, until its next period of when it's going to start to divide uh, into two cells again. So this is that interphase, and this is the longest period of the cell's life. Uh, so during this time, the cell is going to carry out all of its routine activities. Uh, it's going to be growing. It's going to you know. Um, it'll create uh, more mitochondria, for example, if it's a muscle cell. Uh, it'll do whatever it, whatever uh, that cell uh, of that, you know, whatever that body cell is supposed to be doing. It's going to carry out its normal functions. Um, now, during interphase, the nuclear material that we see inside uh, the cell, it's in an uncondensed form that's called a chromatin state. And when you look at this in, in this uncondensed form, it kind of just looks like a like crazy string that's it's, you know it's just spread out all over within the nucleus of that cell. Uh, now interphase it consists of subphases and these subphases they include the process of DNA replication as we'll see. These subphases first of all they get broken uh, down into three uh, th three parts. Uh, the first one is what we call the G1 phase. Uh, there's also a, G, a G0 phase when a cell is no longer dividing or when it's uh, when it enters, when it permanently stops dividing, then we say that the cell is in the G zero phase. But the G sub one phase, this is uh, the time during that cell is it's it's growing, it's going about doing everything that it normally does. It's you know it's metabolizing. Uh, so again, this is the normal part of the cell's life cycle. So it goes about doing its normal business. That, that you know, if, like I said earlier, if it's a mitochondria, if it's a muscle cell. Then you know it's going to be contracting. Uh, it's going to do all the work that it normally does. Uh, so, if it's a I don't know, a, for example, a white blood cell, it's going to go about doing you know whatever work that you know that white blood cell needs to do, uh, and you know it's going to be reproducing itself. It's going to be taking care of itself. The next phase, which is the the S phase, the synthetic subphase. Uh, what's happening here is that the DNA is replicating. Uh, in other words, you're getting the exact copy of the DNA. Because remember, the end result is what we want: two exactly identical cells. And the only way that's gonna that's you know that's gonna happen is if you have the exact copy of this of the DA, of the DNA from the parent cell. Uh, so uh, this is what this S phase, uh, the what's happening in the synthetic uh, subphase. Uh, now. The last phase is the this uh, the G2 phase or the gap two, uh, and this is the final phase of interphase, uh, and it, it's quite brief. Uh, it's not it's not a long period. Uh, the, uh, over here we have the enzymes and other proteins that are needed for division that get synthesized, and they ended up moving to their proper sites. Uh, by the end of the G2 phase, the, we start to see uh, central replication uh, being complete. Uh, and the cell is ready to divide. It's ready to move on to the next process of um, it's ready to start with mitosis now. So you can see over here we have the this uh, graphic it represents the, the the cell cycle. So the largest phase of the cell cycle is this interphase right and during interphase um, notice that you see these uh, the three uh, the, the subphases the G1, uh, the S and the G2 and remember during this phase G1 the normal the cell's normal cycle is going on. It's growing. It's it's doing whatever it needs to do metabolically. That's what's taking place now during the S subphase. All right, uh, this F S subphase. What's happening is that the DNA is the main thing that's happening is the DNA is being synthesized. All right, and then finally uh, once the the DNA is uh, synthesized, th this last phase, uh, the G two phase uh, subphase, all the final preparations. Are taking place before uh, we move on to this next uh, phase. Before we move on to the mitotic phase, 
Uh, so again, if you look at it, uh, this is, interphase is not really a resting phase. You know, it's some people they call it resting. It's not really a resting, but it's more of a growth phase because that's what's going on. The only thing it's resting from uh, in interphase is that it's resting from uh, the, the dividing. Okay, it's resting from cell division taking place. That's it. Otherwise, the cell is going. It's being very, very, very busy. Uh, and then you can see the mitotic phase consists of a prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and a telophase. Uh, an acronym you guys can use, you know, a mnemonic that you can use to remember this, uh, PMAT, okay, so P is for prophase, M is for metaphase, A is for anaphase, and T is for telophase. Um, and then finally you have uh, cytokinesis, where you end up having the two uh, uh, daughter cells, the, or the two cells, uh, that would that when they divide, when they pull apart from another, that's uh, cytokinesis. And this is what you're seeing over here. So DNA replication, um, we're going to be... So now let's look at DNA replication. So prior to division, the cell makes a copy of the DNA. And what happens is the double-stranded DNA, uh, it unwinds and unzips by uh, this enzyme called... Um, a helicase enzyme. It's the DNA helicase enzyme. It comes and it unwinds and it unzips. Now this takes place at a, a replication fork. This is where the strands they separate. And this entire area where the replication is going to be taking place is referred to as the replication bubble. Now each strand, it serves as a template for the new complementary strand. Because remember, what we're going to have at the end is we're going to have an exact copy of uh, the genetic material. We want exact copies. And if you guys remember, DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, they the both strands they complement one another. Uh, so that's why you have these complementary base pairs that make them up. So when you split them open, what you're doing is you're, you're making exact copies of of the complements uh, of each strand. Uh, now RNA uh, starts the replication by laying down these uh, uh, what's called this RNA this primase. Uh, and uh, so it sets up the primer. So what, when RNA comes in, uh, after you've unzipped this and you've unwind it, uh, the RNA, uh, the, the primase, it comes in and it uh, lays down this primer. And now what it, it does is it sets up the stage for the next part where you have DNA polymerase. DNA polymerase, it comes and attaches to the primer and then it starts adding the nucleus to start forming these new strands. So the polymerase, it doesn't know where to start or what to do until it finds, uh, until it gets those, uh, those primers there. And again, remember, that's RNA, okay? So these pr those primers are uh, the, the RNA. So the DNA polymerase synthesizes both the new strand at one time, uh, leading, uh, making a leading and a lagging strand. So, um, however, what they don't tell you over here is that uh, the DNA, actually, okay, so they tell you over here, DNA polymerase, it works only in one direction. Now, when you look at uh, DNA molecules, they have directions, but unlike the directions that we use, you know, right, left, or north, south, they don't have that. Instead, the directions that they, that, that we use um, in DNA is uh, five prime and three prime. Okay, these, these are the directions that we, that, that we use. And DNA polymerase, it can only work continuously in the five prime to three prime direction. Uh, when you go the other way in the three prime to five prime direction, uh, it uh, works and breaks. Okay, so it makes like little segments uh, as it moves along. Uh, so it's uh, these these discontinuous segments are referred to as uh, Okazaki fragments. Uh, so when you have these discontinued segments. Another enzyme called DNA ligase, it comes and it connects them together, it glues them up together. Uh, so the end result that we end up having is are these two identical daughter DNA molecules uh, that end up being formed from the original. So during the mitotic cell division, uh, one complete copy is given to each new cell. Okay. We call this process semi-conservative replication because what we end up getting is this uh, new double-stranded DNA, which is made up of one old strand and one new strand. So if you look over here, what's going on is this. This is a uh, 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 replication fork that we have over here, uh, and this replication bubble, this area here. And so to relate to that idea, this uh, of uh, semi-conservative replication, so this strand over here, the polymerase is copying uh, this uh, 
this one strand over here and then this DNA polymerase is copying this one DNA strand over here. So what you end up having is getting this brand, th this lagging strand that's being created here and this uh, leading strand here. So now you have uh, the new DNA mo molecule that's made the copy. It's going to be made up of this one original strand and this one original strand and then this is the new strand here and the new strand here. So each DNA, new DNA that's going to be made is going to be made up of an original and a new, an original and a new. And this is what we call this semi-conservative replication. So let's start from the beginning now and look at this entire process and uh, see what's going on. So remember what happened is that after you split this, okay, after the helicase enzyme came and split this, uh, and the primer came and started laying down the, the primers. Then you had the polymerase, which started adding nucleotides. And remember what we talked about leading and lagging strands. Uh, so, and remember when we talked about DNA being able to, uh, uh, the polymerase being able to, to, to move continuously from a five prime to a three prime direction. So, this is a five prime end, this is the three prime end. So, it's going in this direction over here. Now, don't worry about five prime and three prime. Um, you know, when you guys take in a, uh, a biology class, a DNA class in biology, then you'll be able to look at these things uh, at more detail uh, and depth. But for, you know, I don't think uh, for this purpose, you, you need to worry too much about that. But know that, make sure you understand that there are directions that they work with. Um, so in this direction, the nucleotides are added continuously in this five to three prime direction. Now in the opposite direction, okay, this three prime to five prime direction, uh, the polymerase, it's not able to add these uh, nucleotides continuously. In other words, it's adding into fragments. So again, this is why we call them the lagging strand because it's not working continuously. It's happening slowly. So over here, it's going to add a couple of things and it breaks up. It adds a couple other things, it breaks up. So then when, what we end up having is DNA ligase. It comes and it connects these two. And it's not showing it to you in this uh, illustration. It might We might see it uh, in a few, uh, few slides later. But if it's not here, please be sure to go online and, uh, you know, uh, look for an animation uh, or your book. I'm sure the, the, in, if you go to the website uh, for the book or in the DVD, uh, there's animations that show you this process taking place. So this is the animation uh, for, actually the, the book does have an animation, so be sure you look at this, go to the website. Uh, you can see it all there as well. And I'm sure there's probably a video of this on YouTube that you can search, search out as well. Um, so. Cell division, so most of the cells, uh, they need to replicate continuously in order for growth and repair process to take place. The exceptions are the skeletal muscle, cardiac, and nerve cells. They do not divide very efficiently. So damaged cells, they end up getting replaced with scar tissue. Now, the mitotic phase or the M phase uh, of the, cells, uh, the cell cycle, this is the, the, the phase in which division is taking place. Uh, so, and we have two distinct events. We have the mitotic, uh, event and then you have cytokinesis, the cytokinetic uh, event. Uh, now controls of cell, cell division is crucial. Uh, so the cells they divide when necessary but they don't divide unnecessarily. And one of the things that happens with when you look at cancer is that these cells they're continuously dividing unnecessarily. You're getting bad cells, non-functional cells and also they're just you know it's an uncontrolled growth of these cells. Uh, so, you know, this is a problem with, with uh, one of the issues with, uh, with cancer of, of what happens is you have this uncontrolled, unregulated uh, cell replication uh, that takes place uh, in cancer. So again, uh, what we're talking, we're, we're going to be looking at now is this M phase, this mitotic phase, and then uh, cytokinesis. So I, I told you earlier, uh, this mitotic phase, uh, it consists of prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. So uh, PMAT, if you guys remember that, uh, that'll help you, you know, remember the order of uh, the, the mitotic phases that occurs. And then it's followed by cytokinesis. And in cytokinesis, this is when the cell actually gets divided into two new cells. So the other thing that I want to mention to you before we move on to the next slide is to understand the big picture. Uh, being that, uh, remember, we had this one cell and we want to make two exact copies of it. So the first thing that needs to happen in order to make an exact copy of the cell is that we need to replicate the DNA. We need to make an exact copy of the DNA. And that happens right over here during interphase. So after this is taking place, after the DNA has been uh, uh, replicated, then we need to uh, divide that uh, DNA into two new cells. And that's what uh, happens in this mitotic phase. So as we move on, uh, in the M phase, or the mitotic phase, so mitosis, this is the division of the nucleus in which the duplicated DNA is distributed to the new daughter cells. Uh, so in other words, you want to have 
two exact copies to the two new cells. Now there's four stages of mitosis uh, that takes place uh, to ensure that each cell receives an exact uh, full copy of the genetic material. And as you've already seen that, uh, that's uh, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. PMAT. In early prophase, the chromatin it condenses forming these bar-like chromosomes that we can see with the light microscope. Each duplicated chromosome, it appears as these two as identical threads that we call these sister chromatids. The, these sister chromatids, they're held together at this constricted region that we call the central mare. So the central mare is holding these two sister chromids together. Uh, as the chromosomes appear, the nucleoli, it starts to disappear. And then the two centrosomes, they separate from one another. Now the centrosomes, they act as these focal points for the growth of microtubule assemblies called these mitotic spindles. Now as these microtubules, they start to lengthen, they move the centrosomes toward the opposite uh, ends of the cell. So we call these opposite ends the poles. Uh, microtubule arrays called these asters, they start, they're also starting to appear at this point, And we can see them extending from the matrix around the centrosome. In late prophase, while the centromeres are still moving apart, we start to see the nuclear envelope fragment. So it's starting to disappear. And this allows for the spindles to interact with the chromosomes. Now some of the growing spindle microtubules, they attach to kinetochores. Now these kinetochores, these are uh, special structures that we find on the, on the chromosomes. Um, and what they do is they act as anchors for these spindles attached to. And this is important because uh, it's going to be, this is how these chromosomes, they're able to move about uh, within the cell. So as we're going to see in the next few slides, these chromosomes, they come to the center and then eventually this, the, 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 when, the, when these chromosomes, when these sister chromatids, they get pulled apart, uh, the way that it's happening is because of these kinetochores that are present on there. That's how it's able to take place. One of the reasons why it's able to take place. Now, the remaining spindle microtubules, uh, which, uh, which, you, which are not attached to, to any of the chromosomes, these are called polar microtubules. Now these non kinetochore core microtubules, they push against one another and they cause the poles of the cells to move further apart. So in this illustration, we can see early prophase going on. And this is a picture, uh, but it's easier to, to understand by the illustration. So what we see over here, this is a, the, uh, the nuclear envelope that you see over here. And this is the chromosome. These are the chromosomes. So the chromosomes are made up of these chromatids. OK, these sister chromatids. You have two sister chromatids. And these sister chromatids, they're held together in place at this central mirror. OK, so central mirror, chromatids, and chromosome. Now, what we also see over here is you have these, uh, these centrioles. You have these two centriole, tr centrioles. Uh, so each, and you have two centrioles here. So these are each called the, the centrosomes. Okay, so centrosomes can serve these two centrioles. And then you see these uh, spindle fibers, these early mitotic spindle fibers. And you see that they're starting to move apart. So one is going in this direction, the other is going in the other direction. So they're kind of pushing each other away. And then right over here, where you s start to see these star-shaped spindles are in a pair. This is what we refer to as these aster over here. Now, as you move into the next part, this late prophase, you see what happened over here is that the nuclear envelope is fragmented. It's gone. And then you also see that these, uh, so here you can see some of the fragments over here, some of the fragments over here, some of the fragments over here. And then you see over here, these uh, structures over here. Uh, so first of all, these are these microtubules. Okay, see these kinetochore microtubules, eventually they're going to attach themselves onto these little parts, these little protein structures. You call these kinetochores. And again, you, the kinetochores you find at the central, uh, at the central mares. All right. So what this does is notice you have a kinetochore on each and we have one over here, one over here. So in this illustration, you can see how they are attached to the spindles. One is attached to here, another one is attached to here. So eventually what's going to happen is, uh, the first thing that's going to happen is these, both of these, uh, they're all going to end up getting pulled towards the middle. So that's what's happening right now in, in late prophase is that they're going to, once they get attached, they start to eventually move towards the middle or to this. This is referred to as the equator of the cell, okay? The middle of the, uh, of the cell is referred to as the equator. So uh, what's going to happen in this next stage as we go on is that uh, in, in, meta, in, in metaphase, uh, you're going to see that the chromosomes, they line up in the equator, okay? Or the middle of the cell. So here we go into metaphase. 
So as we said, in, mantra, in metaphase, uh, this is the second phase of my mitosis, and the two centrosomes, they're at the opposite poles of the cell. That's what we see over here. And the other main thing that we see is that the chromosomes, they cluster at the equator of the cell. In other words, they come to the middle of the cell. Uh, their centromeres, they're precisely aligned at the equator of the spindles. Um, so when we go to the next uh, image, you'll be able to see that. So here we go in this image, and you can see over here uh, that this is the equator of the cell, okay? And this also referred to as the, the metaphase plate. So uh, again, you can see the chromosomes, they're clustering at this, uh, at this equator at the midline uh, of the cell. Uh, and then you can see the, the centromeres. They're almost, you know, they're precisely, they're aligned at this equator. So there, there goes the centromeres right there, and notice that they're right at this midline. Just about, this one's a little bit off, but again, the, the bulk of them, they, they are at uh, the, the, the metaphase plate, okay, or the equator of the cell. Uh, so think of this M phase, okay, when you look at metaphase, M phase, think of M as being in the middle, and that's what's happening. The chromosomes are coming to the middle, okay, in M phase, or the metaphase plate. Anaphase is the third and the shortest phase of mitosis. Anaphase starts abruptly as the centromeres of the chromosomes are split simultaneously. Now each chromatid becomes its own chromosome. Motor proteins in the kinetochores, they gradually pull each chromosome towards the poles they face. At the same time, the polar microtubules, they slide past one another, lengthening and pushing the two poles of the cells apart. Now, anaphase is very easy to recognize because when you look at the moving chromosomes, they take on this V-shaped appearance. So here's the anaphase, and again, you can see that it's very easy to, to distinguish because, uh, again, you look at these chromosomes, they take on this V-shaped appearance. Uh, and then over here, you can see these uh, kinetochore mic microtubules. They're pulling uh, these sister chromatids apart away from this, uh, the, the, the M plate, okay, the, 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 the equator. So now they're going to these opposite poles. So again, this is anaphase. Telophase begins as soon as the chromosomal movement stops. This final phase is like prophase in reverse. Now, the identical sets of chromosomes at the opposite poles of the cells, they uncoil and they resume their chromatin form. Now, keep in mind, the only time the DNA, it condenses and turns into chromosomes is during cell division, okay? It's during mitosis. Uh, in interphase, it's going to be in the chromatin form, okay? Uh, so, the other thing that you see is the nuclear envelope, it's starting to form again as well. Okay, so the nuclear envelope, it forms around each chromatin mass, the nucleoli reappears within the nuclei, and the spindles, they break down and they start to disappear. At this point, we can say that mitosis is over, mitosis is ended. Uh, the cell, for just a brief period, is a binucleate, meaning, you know, it's got two nuclei, and each nucleus is identical to the original mother nucleus. So now you have exact carbon, carbon copies uh, of DNA, at this point in one cell. Remember, this happens, it's, it's, it's there for only a very short period of time because the next stage, it's not part of my, mitosis, but the next stage, what's gonna happen is the cell's gonna split up into, it's gonna completely split up uh, from one another. And that is called cytokinesis. So cytokinesis, burning, it, it actually starts during late anaphase and it continues through mitosis. Uh, a ring of actin microfilaments, it contracts to form this cleavage furrow. And Eventually, what ends up happening is you now that uh, is that these it's going to pinch off, and then you end up with two daughter cells. Okay, so these microfilaments they end up contracting and uh, splitting it, uh, that one cell into two identical cells with you know that same DNA. That's why we call them identical cells. So here you go. Uh, this is you can see this cleavage furrow. So again, these are these actin filaments uh, th that are coming in, and you can see it's starting to constrict. Uh, this area. So this is that cleavage furrow that it forms. So uh, yes, this is telophase now, and look what's happening. Uh, you can start to see the nuclear envelope is starting to form. Uh, the spindles are they're gone. They're, they're, they've disappeared uh, at this point as well. You can see the nucleolus starting to re form as well. Uh, and then what you're going to see is these uh, these sister chromatids. They're start, they're going to start to uncondense, and they're going to turn into chromatin. Be sure to look at this animation. Uh, if you have the DVD, look, you can find it there, or you can go to the website for Pearson and uh, find it there. In addition, you can always uh, search on YouTube for this video. As far as control of cell divisions, uh, there are go and stop signals that direct when a cell should and should not divide. Now, while these aren't understood very well, 
we do have some idea of what to, of, of uh, some of the things that the, that can cause a cell to divide, uh, or some of the things that, that that provide favorable environments for these cells to divide. We should say. Uh, so one of the things we know is that uh, the ratio of a cell surface area to the cell volume is important. Uh, other things like uh, chemicals, like growth factors, and hormones, uh, they also can provide uh, these go signals. Uh, now, things that could stop, or these stop signals, uh, they could be the ability of space. So normal cells, they start dividing when they become when they come into contact with other cells. And this is referred to as contact inhibition. Two groups of proteins are crucial to the ability of a cell to accomplish the S phase and enteromitosis. Uh, they are cyclins and CDKs, or cyclin-dependent kinases. Cyclins, these are the regulatory proteins that accumulate during interphase. And the CDKs, or the cyclin dependent kinases, they activate cyclins when they bind to one another. Uh, cyclins, CDK complex, in turn, it activates enzyme cascades that prepare the cell for division. Now, cyclins are destroyed after mitotic cell division, and then they start the process all over again. Checkpoints are key events in the cell cycle where cell division processes are checked, and if faulty, they're stopped until repairs are made. Now, the G1 checkpoint, this is a, it's also it's a restriction point, uh, this is the most important of the three major checkpoints. If the cell doesn't pass, it enters this G, G sub zero phase in, in which there's no more uh, division that's going to be occurring in that cell. Uh, the other th thing that could happen is the cell, it can undergo apoptosis. In other words, it's going to end up self-destructing. So in this illustration, you can see you have interphase in, in the mitotic phase over here, or the M phase. So what they're trying to show you, what we're looking at uh, specifically are these over here, this, uh, this checkpoint here, and then this checkpoint over here. So uh, again, so during interphase, uh, when the cell comes to this G1 checkpoint, it's checking to make sure that everything is okay. Uh, if it passes this checkpoint, if there's nothing wrong with the cell, everything is okay, it has everything that it needs, then it's going to continue on and enter. Uh, eventually enter this, uh, the S phase, okay, this in, the, in, in undergo DNA synthesis. Uh, however, if there is an issue over here at this restriction point, then what's going to happen is the cell is going to stop. It's going to enter this G0 phase. It's not going to divide anymore. That's the end of it, okay? Or in certain cases, it can undergo uh, apoptosis. In other words, uh, cell death, okay? So the cell ends up killing itself. Now, if everything is okay and it does continue through this S phase and it goes on to G2, then there's a, after this G2 phase, there's also this uh, second checkpoint, this G, G2 checkpoint, or this G2M uh, checkpoint, uh, that they call it. And what this is looking for is this, at this point, it's looking for this uh, MPF protein complex, which is this M phase uh, promoting uh, factor. So if this protein complex is present in, uh, sub, uh, in enough, uh, in substantial quantities, then it can proceed on to the mitotic phase, okay? So at this point, it's pr only looking for this uh, MPF uh, complex, all right? And then once that's the case, then again, you get prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase that takes place uh, as you go, you know, as you continue uh, to, to move forward. Uh, now let's take a look at protein synthesis. So DNA is a master blueprint that holds the code for protein synthesis. Now remember, DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. And DNA, it directs the order of amino acids in a polypeptide. Now, a segment of DNA that holds the code for one polypeptide is referred to as the gene, okay? Now, the code is determined by the specific order of nitrogenous bases, and those nitrogenous bases are adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine, okay? So, the code is determined by the specific order of these uh, nitrogenous bases in the gene. Now, this code, it's made up of three uh, sequential bases, or what we call this triplet, okay, or triplet code. So, for example, when you see uh, G, G, C, G stands for guanine, guanine, C stands for cytosine. So, this codes for the amino acid, G, G, C is the code for the amino acid proline, okay? Or you could have uh, another, another triplet would be G, C, C, for example. So, guanine, cytosine, and cytosine. This codes for, this is one of the codes for arginine, okay? Each triplet specifies a code for a particular amino acid. Uh, genes, these are complex, uh, these are, com so genes, they're made up of exons and introns. Now, exons are part of the genes that actually codes for the amino acid, okay? That's an exon. 
exons it codes for the amino acids introns these are non-coding se segments okay that are interspersed among the exons so introns these are kind of like a just think of them as kind of like a space okay uh, these non-coding spaces we don't really know what they mean okay it's just stands for nothing so this is where introns are exons this is the stuff that holds a meaning and value are the exons right so exons and introns be sure to watch this animation uh, about DNA and RNA. Again, look at the back of your book. Uh, there might be a DVD there, or you can go to the Pearson website, or again, you can uh, look for it on uh, YouTube. So now let's look at the role of RNA. So RNA stands for ribonucleic acid, and RNA is a go-between molecule that links DNA to proteins. RNA, it copies the DNA code uh, in the nucleus, and then it carries it into the cytoplasm to the ribosomes. Now, all RNA is formed in the nucleus. RNA is different from DNA in the following uh, ways. Uh, one of the things is that uh, in DNA, where we have uh, thiamine and adenine uh, complementing one another, in RNA, we don't have thiamine. Instead, we have uracil. So when you have uh, adenine on the DNA, the, the corresponding... Uh, 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 base uh, that we're going to find on RNA, it's not going to be uh, thiamine. Instead, we're going to find uracil. Okay. Uh, the other thing we have is that uh, we see that RNA, it has uh, the sugar ribose instead of uh, DNA where we had the sugar deoxyribose. Now, there's three types of RNA that we're going to be looking at. We're going to be looking at messenger RNA, we're going to be looking at ribosomal RNA, and then we're going to be looking at transfer RNA. Messenger RNA or mRNA, it's single-stranded, and it's the code from DNA template strand that's copied with the complementary base pairs, and this results in this mRNA strand. And the process is referred to as transcription. mRNA, it maintains the triplet codon, okay, or this triplet code uh, from the DNA. So what happens is uh, when, you, when that uh, DNA is, is unwound and you're copying, so again, this is... Uh, process of transcription. You're taking this DNA code and you're converting it into an mRNA strand. Uh, this process is called transcription. We'll look at it graphically in a few slides uh, as we move along. Then we have ribosomal RNA. Now ribosomal RNA or RNA, this is a structural component of ribosomes, uh, the organelle where protein synthesis takes place, or this is the, the, the protein building uh, structure. So along with tRNA, uh, this helps to translate the message from mRNA, uh, mRNA, messenger RNA, into polypeptides. Then we have tRNA or transfer RNA. Now, transfer RNA, it, it, it's a carrier of amino acids. Uh, they have, uh, tRNA consists of a, a special area that contains uh, a, a very specific triplet code that we call the anticodon. And this anticodon, it allows each tRNA to carry uh, only a specific amino acid uh, and bring it over to the corresponding uh, and, and line up with the corresponding uh, uh, codon uh, that we find uh, in the messenger RNA molecule. So the anticodon, the tRNA, it complementary base pairs with the codon of the mRNA uh, at the ribosome. Uh, so again, it adds to this, uh, it, it, it is going to bring specific amino acids and add to it uh, to grow this uh, polypeptide chain. And this process is called translation. Now, protein synthesis, it occurs in two steps. Uh, one of them, the very first part, is called transcription. And this is taking information from DNA and coding it into mRNA. Okay? Then you have translation. And translation, uh, this is where we, when we take the mRNA and we start assembling this polypeptide chain. This occurs inside the nucleus. This occurs in the cytosol of the cell. Okay, so this translation occurs outside of the nucleus. So when you're looking over here, here we have your DNA right over here, okay? So what's the first thing that's going to happen is when this uh, DNA, it unwinds and it unzips, you end up getting one of these pairs, okay? Because it doesn't make, make a difference which pair, right? Because they're complementary base pairs. So anyways, you, you take, oh, when one of these base pairs is opened up, what you end up having next is that uh, from it, you end up... Um, uh, uh, getting uh, a pre-mRNA that gets produced. Okay, now this pre-mRNA 
it consists of uh, exons and introns. But again, what you have are these corresponding anti uh, these corresponding uh, uh, base pairs uh, from DNA that translate into uh, the the pre mRNA. All right. So again, eventually, once the uh, by by process of splicing, uh, once these pre mRNA uh, it gets processed, then it turns into this mRNA. Eventually, this mRNA it's going to leave the nucleus through this uh, these uh, pores, the nuclear pores. And then it, it'll go out into the cytosol of the cell, where it's going to attach itself onto this uh, ribosome. Okay, this is the rRNA, the ribosomal RNA. And notice that the ribosomal RNA it consists of uh, uh, two pieces. Okay, uh, you have a uh, one large piece, and then you have a small piece. We're going to be talking about these two pieces also. Uh, then we have these. Uh, so the, here is your your mRNA, and as this mRNA is it's uh, being moved along. What they don't show you over here is that a tRNA molecules it ends up coming and bring these uh, amino acids uh, to uh, this uh, uh, ribosomal RNA, uh, and it ends up building this polypeptide chain. And so this process that's going on over here, this building of these polypeptide, this is uh, and the reading of it uh, by the ribosome is referred to as translation. Okay, transcription and translation. So if you want to look at it very simplistically, in a nutshell, uh, you take DNA, and DNA's got its own language, which uh, you know this RNA doesn't understand over here. Okay, this ribosomal RNA doesn't understand. It doesn't know how to read the DNA language. So what it does is it uh, it takes this DNA's language, okay, and then it codes it into its own language, its mRNA. So once you have it into this mRNA, then this guy is going to come out, and then it ends up getting read by this guy, this uh, ribosome, and then it starts building the proteins. Okay, very simplistically, in a nutshell, essentially that's what's what's going on. And, uh, you know, you're building these proteins, if that's what this is, uh, th th which is what's occurring over here. So now let's look at transcription in a little bit more detail. Uh, so remember the big picture is that we want to build protein. And how are we going to build protein? Well, we need to know what the protein is made of. We need the directions. And where is this direction stored? Or where is it found? It's found in the DNA. Now, the way that we get these directions from DNA into being it actually produced is with the help of RNA. So the very first thing that needs to happen is we need to take this, uh, the, these directions and convert it into a language that is compatible with RNA. And that first step is, uh, the, the, is what this step is about, transcribing it. Uh, so it's able to work with RNA, and that happens uh, by creating this mRNA strand, okay, which complements uh, the DNA uh, base pairs. So this is what's 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 going on. This is ex essentially what's happening. Transcription is not able to start until gene-activating chemicals called transcription factors. They stimulate loosening of the histones at the site to be of the gene uh, transcription, and then bind to the promoter. The promoter, this is a special DNA sequence that contains the start point, which is uh, uh, the, the beginning of the structural gene to be transcribed. Now, it specifies where the messenger RNA synthesis starts and which DNA strand is going to serve as a template strand. The transcription factors, they also help position RNA polymerase, which is the enzyme that oversees the synthesis of mRNA, correctly at the promoter. Now, once these preparations are made, RNA polymerase it can start the transcription process. Now, transcription can be broken down into three phases. The first one is initiation. So once bound with the help of transcription factors, the RNA polymerase, it pulls apart the strands of the DNA double helix, so transcription can start at the start point in the promoter. In the second step, during elongation, RNA polymerase, it adds the complementary nucleotides to the growing mRNA, matching the sequence of the bases on the DNA template strand. So these, we end up getting these short 12 base uh, pair segments where the DNA and mRNA are temporarily bonded to, uh, which we refer to as this DNA-RNA hybrid. When the polymerase reaches a special base sequence called the termination signal, this is when transcription ends, and this newly formed mRNA, it pulls off the, the DNA template. So we can see in this, uh, in this illustration here, the series of events that we just described. So remember, in the first step, what happens is you get this RNA polymerase molecule. Uh, with the help of these, uh, uh, with the transcription factors, 
uh, it's going to end up coming in and uh, aligning itself and, and attaching itself onto this uh, this promoter region. Okay, so and this promoter region is where the start point is going to be found at. Uh, now, once that's happened, this uh, the polymerase RNA polymerase is going to start moving or reading and elongating this in this direction over here. Okay, and uh, so. Actually, so then we say initiation. So let's just go over here with the first step. So with the help of the transcription factor, the polymerase, it binds to the promoter. Uh, it pries open the, the two strands, and it starts, uh, uh, and it initiates this mRNA synthesis at the start point on the template. Take two. So in this illustration, it's kind of showing you uh, the series of steps that we just talked about in the previous uh, uh, few slides. Uh, so this is your RNA polymerase, and this is your DNA over here, okay? And this is a promoter region, and this is the termination signal over here. And this is the part uh, of the, the gene, okay, on this DNA molecule that's going to be coded for. Uh, so uh, this is the, the template strand here, and this is the, the coding strand over here. So what's going to happen is this. Uh, as... Uh, this uh, so the first thing is again with the help of these transcription factors, this uh, RNA polymerase is going to uh, attach itself. It's going to bind to this promoter region over here. Okay, so it pries this apart, it unwinds it, and unzips it, uh, and then it starts. Uh, it initiates this uh, mRNA synthesis at this start point uh, on the the template strand. Okay, over here. So this is where, where it's going to start uh, kicking off the. Uh, the, the mRNA synthesis uh, with this strand over here. Now, as the, the so as this mRNA polymerase moves along, so again it's going in this direction over here. Uh, this elongation is this is what they're talking about elongation. So what ends up happening is as it's going along here, as this polymerase is reading uh, the the codes from the DNA, it's going to start uh, adding the 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 RNA the the, the codons uh, in this direction, going from there to there. Okay. So it's being read this way, and the the the, the new uh, uh, the bases, uh, they're, the new nucleotides, uh, they're being added on w at the, where this arrow is. Okay, that so they're being added on, and this mRNA molecule starts to elongate. So when you look over here, uh, alrighty, we're over here at this step now. So uh, yeah, the double helix uh, before it, uh, it, so it unwinds uh, the DNA double helix before, and it rewinds the double helix behind it. So as it moves along. Uh, it opens up this part in front, and then it starts to zip up or uh, the parts behind it uh, as well. Now, number three, termination. So when this uh, RNA polymerase, it reaches this termination signal, that means, okay, it's done. So it's going to get kicked off uh, the, the DNA molecule, uh, and then it's going to separate, the, as well as the, the, the RNA, or this is now actually called the pre-mRNA. Uh, both of these get kicked off. Uh, and this is called, it doesn't say it, but it should say pre-mRNA molecule over here because this has both, uh, uh, well, we'll see, uh, introns and exons here as well that need to be uh, cut out or spliced. So, yeah, there we go. Now they're going to talk about processing of the this uh, mRNA. So the newly formed mRNA uh, is then edited and processed before translation can begin. So before processing is referred to as pre-mRNA. So these introns, they're removed by special proteins that are called spliceosomes, uh, which then ends up leaving only the exon regions, the coding regions. Uh, now we go to the next step, which is, so we just talked about transcription. Now we're going to be looking at translation. Now the steps of protein synthesis, where the language of the nucleic acid is translated into the language of the proteins, is referred to as translation. Uh, now this involves messenger RNA, the use of ge the genetic code, uh, transfer RNA and ribosomes, uh, translating events, and sometimes also uh, the rough endoplasmic reticulum uh, comes into place. So as you can see, this is quite, uh, it's a more involved, it's a little bit of a more complex step because what you have going on during translation uh, is that the actual building of the protein or you're starting to assemble, you're bringing all the amino acids and you're assembling this long uh, polypeptide chain uh, in, in translation. So you're taking the language of uh, mRNA and you're uh, bringing, uh, you're recruiting all the amino acids that's needed. So 
you're building the proteins at this stage. It, it's a, the, the process of building the proteins has begun. So the genetic code, uh, now each three bases on the DNA, which is referred to, referred to as this triplet code, is represented by a complementary three base sequence on the mRNA uh, that's called the codon. So there's a, possible, uh, there's a possibility of 64 uh, codons that you can take place. And the four bases that we have are uh, A, U, C, and G. Uh, so remember, what do we have? Uh, adenine, uracil, cytosine, and guanine. Uh, so you take these four uh, base places and you have these three places. So then you end up getting uh, four to the third, which is 64. So there's 64 possibilities uh, that you can get. So there's also three stop codons. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. There's also three stop codons. Uh, but the rest are codons for amino acids. Now, there are only 20 amino acids uh, that you have. So uh, this means that some of these amino acids, they're represented by more than one codon. And this redundancy, it helps protect against transcription errors. So over here, this is uh, when we're talking about these codes and, and how they translate into these amino acids, this is what we're talking about. This table, uh, it helps uh, students learn uh, which amino acid, which uh, the, the codons uh, in the mRNA, uh, what uh, the amino acids that they code for. So for example, I'm just going to pick three letters at random. Uh, if on the mRNA you found A, C, A, C, A, okay, I'm going to say. Uh, let's see what that codes for. So the way that you use it is this. This over here, you use the first letters. I said A, C, A, so here's A. Then I said C. So C is over here. So now we have A, C over here. The final letter I said was uh, A. So A, C, A, you're going to see A is over here. So A, C, A is going to be the, the code for uh, threonine. Okay. Now, uh, let's just say, I don't know, there's another one, C, C, A, for example. Here's C over here. Okay, the first letter. The second letter is also a C. And then the, the final letter was an A. So you have C, C, and then the final letter a is right over here, and that codes for the amino acid proline. Now, notice that you have these uh, the stop codons right over here, uh, UAA, UAG, and UGA. And also there's methionine, the initiation codon, which is AUG. Now, let's, let's take a look at the role of tRNA, which stands for transfer RNA. Now, transfer RNA, it binds a specific amino acid at one end, which is referred to as the stem. Now, once an amino acid is loaded onto the tRNA molecule, it's now called amino acyl tRNA, okay? Now, the enzyme that's responsible for attaching uh, an amino acid uh, to the stem is called amino acyl tRNA synthetase, okay? So amino acyl tRNA synthetase is the enzyme that attaches, that links uh, the amino acid uh, onto this stem region. Now, this part over here, this is called the head of the tRNA. And the head, it contains this anticodon. This anticodon is what's going to correspond to the, uh, the, the, the codon of the messenger RNA. Uh, so again, this is a triplet code. Also, the other thing that we need to understand is that this uh, amino acid, I'm sorry, this tRNA molecule, it is very specific to the enzyme, uh, to the amino acid that it carries, all right? So these are all uh, enzyme-specific. Where we said we had 64 codons for about 20 amino acids, uh, well, 64 including some of the, 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 the stop codons. Uh, so, you know, minus the stop codons, and then, you know, what you have left uh, are uh, the different, you know, the, the, the total number of uh, codons that are possible for, to me, uh, for 20 amino acids. Now we have roughly, uh, for these 20 amino acids, we have about 45 different types of tRNA molecules uh, that are able to pick these different uh, amino acids up and bring them over uh, and deliver them to uh, the the uh, ribosomes uh, to for uh, translation uh, to take place. The anticodon of tRNA will bind only to the codon on the mRNA that it complements. So if you have the codon AUA, uh, only the tRNA with the anticodon AUA will be able to bond. Now, ribosomal RNA, uh, it coordinates the coupling of mRNA and the tRNA. Now, the ribosomal RNA, it contains one binding site for the mRNA, and then it has three binding sites for tRNA. 
there's an amino acyl site for the incoming uh, amino acyl tRNA. There's a, uh, a peptidyl site for the tRNA uh, linked to grow this uh, polypeptide chain. And then there is uh, an exit site for the outgoing uh, tRNA. Now, the sequence of events in translation, they uh, occur in three phases, and they require ATP, protein factors, and enzymes. Uh, the three phases, they're initiation, elongation, and termination. So in initiation, we have the small ribosomal subunit that binds to the special initiator tRNA, and then to the mRNA that needs to be decoded. The ribosome scans this mRNA looking for the first methionine codon, which is referred to as the, the start codon. Now notice, we, I, I, you know, I mentioned to you that there's a small ribosomal subunit. So this ribosome, ribosomal RNA it consists of a, a small and a large subunit. And we'll see that in the pictures in, in the next few slides. So now let's talk about that large ribosomal subunit. So when the anticodon of the initiator tRNA binds to that start codon, the large subunit, the large ribosomal subunit, can now attach itself to the small ribosomal uh, unit. And then this is what forms this functional ribosome when these two small and large subunits come together. Now, at the end of initiation, the initiator tRNA is in the P side of the ribosome, and the A and E sites are empty. Elongation involves three steps. In the first step, codon recognition, the tRNA binds complementary codons in the A side of the ribosome. In the second step, peptide bind formation, the ribosomal enzymes transfer and attach the growing polypeptide chains from tRNA in the P site over to the amino acids of the tRNA in the A site. And in the third step, translocation, the ribosomes, they shift down three bases of the mRNA, displacing the tRNAs by one position. So what we have is the tRNA in the A site, it moves into the P site. And then the tRNA, tRNA that was in the P site, it moves into the E site. And then with the tRNA that was in the E site, it gets ejected from the ribosome. Once the A site is empty, a new tRNA is able to enter, bring its own amino acid in, and then the whole process can start over again. Now, after a portion of the mRNA is read, additional ribosomes may attach to the already read part and start another round of translation of the same mRNA. This is what we call the polyribosome, which is a multiple ribosomal mRNA complex that produces multiple copies of the same protein. So in this image over here, illustration here, you can clearly see this, uh, this concept of this polyribosome. So what you have are these multiple complex, uh, the, these ribosomal RNA complexes that are reading, that are simultaneously reading the same mRNA molecule. So as uh, so what's going on is this, you're getting, uh, this is the end, this is the start of the codon. And this incoming subunits, they, they come this way, and this mRNA is moving along uh, this way to the, to the left. Uh, so as this is being left, all these guys are reading the same mRNA and they're producing the same polypeptide, uh, the same uh, amino acid chain uh, that's being produced, the main protein is being produced. So again, what you're getting is the same thing that's been produced over and over and over again. In termination, when one of the three stop codons on the mRNA enters the A site, this is when translation will cease. What ends up happening is the protein release factors, they bind to the stop codon. And when this happens, it causes water to be added to the chain instead of another tRNA. Now, when water comes in, this is going to cause the release of the polypeptide chain. And in addition to that, it's going to separate the ribosome subunits and uh, it causes the degra degradation of the mRNA. Now, this isn't the end of it. What ends up uh, further uh, having is that you have this polypeptide chain. This needs to be processed as well. Now, this is going to go to the other structures, other organelles of the cell, and then it's going to end up getting, getting uh, 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 processed into a functional three-dimensional protein. Now let's look at the series of events that we just discussed uh, graphically in this illustration. So remember, the big picture is that we're trying to make protein. This is the nucleus of the cell, and inside the nucleus you have the genetic information, the DNA, de deoxyribonucleic acid. And the DNA, it has instructions on, on how to make any protein that the cell will need. So the first thing that you do uh, is, the first thing that takes place is transcription. And in transcription, we're taking the DNA and we're creating uh, mRNA from it, okay, that complements this DNA. Uh, so once we have the mRNA, it will then get uh, sent outwards, it, uh, out of this nucleus, and to, it goes to the cytosol. Now the other thing that I want you to, to, to know is that within the, the, the nucleus here, this is also where the ribosomal RNA is being produced. This is also where these 
the, the transfer RNA is being produced. So all that is being produced here and being sent out. Now, once this has uh, been produced, now, now once we have this uh, ribosomal uh, RNA produced, what's going to happen is this mRNA that's within the cytosol, uh, it's going to get attached by this uh, small subunit over here. Now, uh, so yeah, the small subunit, a ribosomal subunit attaches to this mRNA. Uh, now, you end up having this initiator tRNA carrying the amino acid methionine to uh, this, what we, what's going to end up being this P site. So once the, uh, the initiator tRNA uh, comes into play and you have this, uh, the, this, uh, the, the small ribosomal subunit attached, at this point, the large subunit also will come attached. So once the large uh, subunit has attached, now you're ready to roll. So at this point, uh, what we have is that uh, the initiator tRNA is going to be at the P site. Now, the second step in elongation, what's going to end up happening is this. So the amino acid, the, 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 the codon, I'm sorry, this ribosomal subunit is going to start moving along uh, and, and reading this mRNA. And as it's doing that, uh, the tRNA molecules are going to be coming and adding and bringing uh, the amino acids with them. So what happens is this. So you have these, uh, the, the codons over here, all right, on the, the, the mRNA. And then remember, on the tRNA, you have these anticodons. So over here, where you have this codon, CUA, CUA, it is going to pair with the anticodon of the tRNA, GAU. And CUA is looking for, in this case, is looking for the amino acid uh, leucine, uh, leucine. So what's going to happen now is this tRNA, tRNA molecule is going to come and attach itself over here to the A site. So notice over here you have the A site, the P site, and the E site. All right. So when this, uh, this um, uh, tRNA molecule attaches to the A site, the next thing that's going to happen is that the Prote the, the amino acid chains that was over here, the polypeptide that, was that, that we have on this P site, uh, it's going to end up uh, getting attached or added on. It's going to transfer uh, the, the, these uh, amino uh, acids to that of the newest one that came in, to the leucine. So notice over here you have proline over here. Now when this guy comes in, in the second step, you end up having uh, this, the, this uh, tRNA molecule that was over here it's going to take its proline and it's going to shift it over and place it on top of this leucine that this guy brought in. So if you notice here, this guy's going to come over here. So the next thing that happens is this proline goes and sits on top of this, excuse me, it's going to go and sit on, on top of the, here we go. This proline is going to come and sit on top of this leucine. So this is how this chain is growing. Okay. And the next thing that's going to happen is this. Once the, uh, once, uh, the transfer takes place, then this uh, tRNA is going to end up moving over to the to the E site, and it's going to end up getting ejected. And then what ends up happening is this uh, the new tRNA that ended up bringing the, the the leucine, it's going to end up moving over to the P site, as you see over here. So as this tRNA moves over to the into this P site, it ends up getting the the old. Uh, uh, tRNA, which is holding on to proline, will get ejected uh, from the E site. And then it's going to go to, the it's going to read the, the next amino acid. So in this case, now it's going to be reading uh, this codon over here, CUA. So CUA, it's going to end up bringing another amino acid in, in place. So when, when that happens, uh, then uh, that amino acid that's going to be over here on, on that tRNA molecule, now you end up having this chain with leucine gets uh, get transferred over there, it's going to be sitting on top of that. And eventually, the same process is going to happen over and over and over and over again until you read, reach the stop codon. So again, when you read the stop codon, uh, what's going to end up happening is the large and the subunits, uh, they, they disassemble, and then you end up uh, getting the, the, the this polypeptide chain that is going to end up going getting further processed uh, by the organelles of the cell. So we're going to be looking at the role of the rough endoplasmic reticulum now. So if you guys remember, proteins are synthesized in the rough ER. So how does this happen in, in, in how does this relate it into what we've learned? So what happens is this. A short amino acid segment that's called the ER signal sequence, 
it's present on this growing polypeptide chain. Now, this ER signal sequence is associated uh, with ribosomes to dock onto the rough ER surface. So what happens is uh, there's also the signal recognition particle that we have on the endoplasmic reticulum that directs uh, this uh, mRNA, this ribosome, th this complex, uh, in a, to where to dock. And we're going to see this in the, in the picture when we get to the next, uh, next uh, slide. Now, once you, you have this dock, uh, docking that takes place, uh, the forming polypeptide is able to snake through, uh, through the pores of the rough endoplasmic reticulum uh, inside uh, the cisterns of the, the rough ER. Now, at this point, once you have this, uh, the, um, uh, the polypeptide chain entering uh, the, the, the cisterns of the rough ER, at this point, you can have sugars uh, that, get, uh, that, that, that can be added to the protein. In addition to that, you can alter the shape of, the prote of, the, of, this, uh, of this protein structure as well. After that, the protein, it ends up getting enclosed in vesicles, and it gets sh uh, shipped off to the Golgi apparatus for further processing. So when you look over here, here you have the small subunit, you have the large subunit over here, and this is the mRNA uh, molecule, uh, the mRNA uh, that uh, you see that's, uh, again, running this entire length over here. So what's going to happen now? Well, this is this ER signal sequence that, we, that you see over here, all right? Now this ER signal sequence is going to direct this molecule, uh, and again, the, the large subunit specifically, uh, to where you see this over here, this is this receptor site. So these are these little openings, these pores. So what ends up, what you want is these amino acids that, that, that are gonna be added onto this, uh, uh, to the, to this building polypeptide chain to enter uh, through these pores, uh, through the receptor site and into the cisterns of the rough ER. Now how that happens is this, this, uh, this ER signal sequence, it's gonna end up binding with this, uh, uh, this signal recognition particle. So this sec signal re recognition particle, it, is working with this ER signal sequence to initially get this chain to start entering uh, uh, through this receptor site and for it to be able to uh, be able to snake through uh, inside the rough ER. So now you can see as uh, so once uh, once it's attached to the to the endoplasmic reticulum, uh, the signal recognition uh, particle it gets released and the growing polypeptide it starts to uh, to snake through and grow through this ER membrane. Uh, into the cisterns. Now, once this is, uh, as this is occurring, the next thing that you see, no, will notice over here is that this uh, signal recognition particle is no longer there, okay? The, the ER signal sequence is gone also. So what happens is you end up having an enzyme that comes in and it, it, it clips it off. Now at the same time as th that this is occurring, also what you're getting taking place is that uh, you're getting sugar groups that are, that are being added uh, to this growing uh, protein. Uh, to this uh, gr growing uh, peptide chain. Uh, in addition to that, some of these prote proteins, these peptide chains, they'll start changing their shape also. So they'll start, they may start to take on uh, a 3D conformation. Uh, once everything is complete, so once uh, you get to the stop codon and this peptide chain, is, the peptide chain is released from the, uh, the ribosome, then what you're gonna end up having is uh, this, uh, the, the the polypeptide, the protein, will enter a vesicle, a transport vesicle, and then the transport vesicle will be sent to the Golgi apparatus. And these next set of slides are just essentially going over the same thing that we just spoke about, and which leads to, again, summary from DNA to protein. So the complementary base pairing, it directs a transfer of genetic information in DNA into an amino acid sequence of the protein. So the DNA triplets, they're coded to this mRNA codon. The mRNA codons, they're base paired with the tRNA, the transfer RNA anticodons to make sure that the correct amino acid sequence uh, come into play. Now this anticodon sequence of tRNA is identical to the DNA sequence, except that you have this uracil, which is substituted for thymine. So when we look over here, what do we have? Over here is your DNA sequence. This is your mRNA sequence. You have your tRNA over here. And then finally you have the, the, uh, the polypeptides here, uh, the, or the amino acids over here. So in this example, let's start off with, uh, here, let's just go over here, for example, here. This is better. We'll just start off with uh, serine, all right? This is the amino acid. So the code, uh, the DNA code is gonna be AGC, okay? AGC uh, on the DNA template, we'll get on the mRNA, you'll end up with, remember, A on mRNA, 
uh, does not have T, so mRNA has U instead. So A will correspond with, G, with U. G, you end up corresponding with C, and then C with G, okay? And then the anticodon, okay, for U is A, for C is G, and for G is C. And remember what we said, tRNA is going to be exactly the same as the DNA, with the exception of uracil. Now, if you look over here, A is A, G is G, C is C. All right, so this is the same. Now, in this case, everything was okay. But when you look over here to this next one, let's go to leucine. So you have G, A, T. G will correspond uh, on the DNA to C of the mRNA. A will correspond to U because, remember, RNA does not have thymine. It has uracil instead. And then T will correspond with A over here. Okay? Now let's look at, go from mRNA to the tRNA, to the anticodon. So C is going to be with G, U is going to be with A, and the A is going to be with the U. Remember, the RNA does not have uh, thymine, it only has uracil, that's why we have that. So now, remember what we said, the tRNA, the anti anticodon is going to be exactly the same as the DNA, with the exception of uh, thymine. So G is still G, A is still A, and then U. It should be here, but remember, D doesn't have U. What is U, U have is the T instead. So you have the T over here. All right? So again, this is going to go through until, so you have the start sequence and the stop sequence over here. Now, DNA also codes for other types of RNA. So we have this microRNA. So microRNA, these are small RNAs that they're able to bind and silent mRNAs that are made by certain exons. There's also these riboswitches. Riboswitches, these are these folded RNAs that act as switches that are able to turn protein synthesis on and off in response to certain environmental conditions. Uh, then we have these uh, small interfering RNAs. Uh, they're similar to these miRNAs that we talk about, but they're also, ab uh, they're also able to uh, silence mRNAs from pathogenic sources such as a virus. Now we're going to be looking at apoptosis, uh, autophagy, and pr uh, proteasomes. So cells that have become obsolete or damaged they need to be taken out of the system. So the first one, autophagy, this is uh, self-eating. So this is the process of, uh, process of disposing of non-functional organelles uh, and cytoplasmic bits by forming autophagosomes, which can be degraded by lysosomes. Now, unneeded proteins, they could be marked for destruction by ubiquitins. Now, proteasomes, uh, they disassemble these ubiquitin tagged proteins and they recycle the amino acids and the ubiquitin. Apoptosis, this is also known as programmed cell death. Uh, this causes certain cells, for example, like a, can a cancer cell or infected cells and even older cells to self-destruct. The process starts with mitochondrial membranes leaking chemicals that activates this enzyme called caspases. Uh, cas Caspases is causes degradation of the DNA and cytoskeleton, which then leads to the cells dying. Uh, dead cells, they shrink, and then it gets phagotized by macrophages. Now, all cells of your body, they contain the same DNA, but not all cells are identical or they carry out the same functions. Uh, now, let me say something. All cells of the body contain the same DNA, uh, at uh, some point of their life cycle, yes, all cells of the body, they do contain the same DNA at some point of their life cycle. And the reason I say this is, in the example of your red blood cell, uh, your mature red blood cell, there's no nucleus there, so you're not going to find any genetic information. But the Im immature, when the, uh, the red blood cell it matures, it ejects uh, the nucleus from the cell, and that's how you end up getting this bioconcave uh, uh, shape of this red blood cell. Uh, so anyway, moving forward, uh, chemical signals in the embryo, they channel cells into specific development pathways by turning some, the, by some genes on and, others, uh, and off in others. Now, development of specific and distinctive features in cells is called cell differentiation. Organs are well formed and functional before birth, but, but we need cell division for growth. Cell division in adults is needed for replace, uh, replacing short-lived cells and also for repairing wounds, uh, cells that are wounded. Now, hyperplasia, uh, this is an accelerated growth that increases cell numbers when it's needed. And atrophy uh, is a, a, a decrease in the size uh, that results from a loss of stimulation or use.
Now, when you look at cells that age, now the mechanism of aging is a mystery, but there are several theories, wear and tear theory. So a lifetime of chemical uh, being abused by all, in all these different chemicals and free radicals, they ha end up having their cumulative effect on a cell. Then there's also the mitochondrial theory of aging. Free radicals in the mitochondria, they diminish the energy production. Uh, immune system disorder, so autoimmune responses as well as progressive weakening of the immune uh, system uh, results in uh, uh, cell, cell aging as well. Uh, there's a genetic theory, so cessation of mitosis and cell aging, they're programmed into the genes. Uh, telomer telomeres, these are strings of nucleotides that protect the ends of uh, chromosomes. It's kind of like a caps on the shoestrings. Uh, every time a cell divides, the telomeres, they shorten. So the telomeres, they may act like an hourglass uh, on how many times a cell is able to divide. Now, telomer, uh, uh, telomerases, this is an enzyme, telomerase, uh, that lengthens the telomeres. Uh, and you find this in germ cells or embryos, but it's absent in adult cells, with the exception that we see this in cancer cells. And that is it for this chapter, uh, for chapter three. Uh, hopefully you found this useful. If you have any questions, please send me an email. Uh, let me know what questions you have, and I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, or leave it in the comments below, or you can send me a message through uh, YouTube as well. Uh, if you like it, please give it a thumbs up. Also, please be sure to check out the rest of the videos uh, in the, for, for this chapter, Chapter 3. There's parts A, B, and a C as well. Uh, and then also, you'll find the Chapter 4s and uh, beyond uh, too. Just be sure to view the playlist. Thank you so much for watching and best of luck.